All right. Good morning, everybody. Happy Sunday. I hope you're enjoying yourself today. And some of you are watching right from bed, which is awesome. Some of you are watching this morning, and maybe you're having your cup of coffee with you, right? So you're all ready to roll. Uh, or whether you're like me, I drink tea. You know, have it all ready to roll this morning. And we're excited because today is our first day actually back in the building. So if you hear some voices singing off in the distance, that's because our worship team is prepping. Uh, we also have a small group that's practicing. So hopefully, though, that it'll be pretty confined to our time here. So we're so glad you're watching today. So glad you're checking this out uh, earlier, in fact. So if you're watching at 9 o'clock, which is when we're showing this right now, um, it's a little bit earlier than normal for you. So, um, so th thanks for tuning in. We appreciate you checking us out. A little bit of humor to get us started this morning, because I don't know about you, but sometimes Sunday mornings are a little rough to get going. I got up early this morning, but it was a little rough. How about, have you ever had this happen where you've gone in to have uh, your temperature checked, or maybe you've gone in and especially to have draw blood, or and you wonder what the nurses are talking about afterwards. Now, some of you are nurses, and so this might not be as funny because you don't. You probably think, well, I don't have that conversation, but you see this, and then I said, this won't hurt a bit, right? <laughs> you walk in, and the nurses walk out, and then you know they're kind of chuckling to themselves. They know it's going to hurt a little bit. They try to make sure it doesn't hurt at all, but you know, you and I both know it hurts a little bit. Um. A while back, I was able to take my mom in for surgery, and uh, so it, it took about half an hour for them to get into and get the vein that they were looking for. I just felt so bad for her. And uh, so maybe for some of you, that's what it's like. If you've got small veins, you can relate to that. The other day, other day, I was talking to one of my kids, and uh, they were going on and on, and they had quite a story where they were sharing something. Have you ever thought this? When your kids keep telling a story... And it won't end. I mean, it goes on and on and on forever, it seems like. So one of my daughters popped out of the bed and she was talking about her dream that she had. And she had the most vivid dream that I think I've ever heard in my life. And this dream, she recaptured. It took her 10 minutes and she went. She was talking about all the details. And I was, fa I was like, wow, she could remember all of her dream. But it got to the place about you know, maybe the third or fourth minute where I'm thinking, okay, oh my gosh, this is going to go on and on and on. And for parents right now, we get it, right? We understand it, especially if our kids haven't been in school for a long time. It can feel like that. Well, um, I'm going to share with you here at the end a little event that's coming up here in August that we're very, very excited about. We can't wait to actually... Uh, unveil this to you, let you know what's going on, because it demonstrates that we as a church can be together, and we're going to do something very significant. We're going to be baptizing people, but I'll tell you about that after the message here this morning. So uh, um, it's good to have to be back. It's good to be back. I can't wait for 1015 when we're actually going to have our in-house service. So if you're coming to that, awesome. If you're not able to make it, that's why we're doing this earlier time right now. So uh, a little while back, I went back, and this is back in college years, so it brings me back a number of years. I went on a trip, and it was called La Vida. In fact, I think they're still doing it at a Gordon College. And we went up the Adirondacks for 12 days, and I actually received college credit for it. And there were 9 to 10 people in this particular group, and we did rappelling, we did hiking, we had a 10-mile run at the end of the final day. A 10-mile run. And I, would, I look back and I think, how in the world did I run 10 miles? Um, and it was all challenging, but the most challenging part of us being up there in the Adirondacks was the three-day fast. So we had a fast for three days. They took us out on a river, and they sent us along different places on that river so that we could not see each other. All we had was a Bible. We had um, a little, a little. We we had a Bible. We had our backpack, but we had no food whatsoever. We had a, a sleeping bag. We slept out in the darkness for three nights, and on the the very the next morning, they made us this huge pot of soup, and boy, did we scarf it down, and it was really challenging to be out there. And for those three days, I went through varied emotion, up and down, kind of like a roller coaster. You know, I, there was an exhilaration in the sense that, hey, listen, I'm doing this for the first time. But there was also a sense in which, you know what, I'm really, really hungry. So, and if you were to ask me if there was something I learned during that three-day fast, I could say, yeah, I definitely learned something out of that. I learned the value 
of depending on God when I had nothing to eat. I had brought my Bible, and I studied the Bible, and I prayed. When my circumstances were not ideal, that's what I learned. And I think oftentimes when we go into a trial, physically, emotionally, spiritually, or mentally, we come out the other side, and we have a lesson or two that we've learned, right? You look at your life for a second. I bet you if I was sitting right now, you know, uh, and we were in conversation, maybe in your living room, um, we'd be talking, and I would ask you, hey, listen, what are some of the life lessons that you've learned? I bet you you would say, well... And you start to share off a couple of lessons and you would mention some trials that you've been through. And then you would mention the lesson you've learned on the other side of that trial. Trials are pretty good about bringing out lessons, aren't they? Now think about 2020 for a moment. What do you think about 2020? Give us your little impressions. Just give us a word, perhaps, of what you think about 2020 so far. What, What are your first thoughts? Yeah, just throw a word up there in our comment section. And oh yeah, by the way, you know, good morning, Rob. Good morning, Hope. Um, let us know if you're watching who you're watching with, that would be helpful for us as we're looking through, uh, for attendance purposes. But this morning, right now, but just put down, hello, Peter, good, good morning to you. Put down in the comment section, just one word that kind of summarizes 2020 right now for you. What does that look like? Because we've experienced the following things this, uh, this year in our pandemic. We've, first of all, we've gone through the pandemic and we're still in a place in which we're quarantined, right? the likes of which we've never seen in the history of America. Then we had George Floyd die, uh, largely due to the negligence of a police officer who refused to take his knee off of Floyd's neck. Um, And within eight, eight minutes, he was gone. And his death sparked a firestorm. There were protests everywhere. There were fires in cities, burning buildings burning down. People were being killed. Innocent people were being killed. And that kicked off a movement to defund the police, right? And then we heard about hornets that were two inches long, right? These killer hornets that were coming. And now we have an election year. I mean, talk about crazy 2020. It's horrible. And I see some people are different, right? Lynn Marie wrote, devastating. So we have different words that were described this, this year so far. It's been really hard. It's been difficult. So... I think one of the things that we need to consider today is this. What are some lessons that we've learned in the past few months, particularly as a church, because as a church family, we've learned some things caught in the midst of all this. I mean, it's affected us and how we function because we haven't had church until today for the past three, three and a half months. And so that's been difficult. We've gone to small groups on Zoom. We've gone, we broadcasted on Facebook and YouTube. And so that's been different for us. And we've had to go to fellowship in our communion times on Zoom. And so that looks all different, all different. So what have we learned? Looking back on it, right? Because this is going to happen for us. I guarantee it's going to happen. Your grandkids, your kids are going to look back and say, Mom and Dad, what was 2020 like? Right? They're going to they're gonna kind of look back. What do you remember about 2020? What did you learn? Was there a lesson that you learned? Was there something that you gleaned out of that? If, as you went through all of that stuff, what was it that you learned in the process? So today we're going to talk about one of the lessons that I think is a church that we learned, and we're calling this Lessons Learned, What God is Teaching Us in the Lockdown. Lessons Learned, What God is Teaching Us in the Lockdown. We're going to cover that this week and then next week as well. And there's a quote that I've heard, and perhaps you have too, about never looking back, but I think it's important to do so. And one of the quotes that says this, don't look back. You aren't going that way. Don't look back. You're not going that way. So some people say, listen, don't ever look back. Don't even bother looking back. Just keep moving forward. But I think there's something valuable about looking back and saying, okay, listen, was there something that we learned in the last four, five, six months that we can glean? Albert Einstein once said this. He said, the only mistake in life is the lesson not learned. The only mistake in life is the lesson not learned. And unfortunately, we know that if we continue to live life where it's not evaluated, we're going to repeat the, our history. We're going to repeat the mistakes of the past, and we don't want to do that. So let's talk about one of the lessons that God has taught us in the process of living out 2020. What does that look like? And one of the lessons that I think comes right to the forefront is buried in Philippians. It is a letter that Paul writes to the church at Philippi. And so when you hear like Philippians or Ephesians or Colossians, 
Actually, it's a letter being written to a church that's located there. And so Paul writes this letter to the Philippian church, and he's in jail during this time. I mean, he's in a context where he's confined, he's chained to a Roman prison guard, so not really fun. But he makes the most of his time, and he starts writing off letters. And he writes this letter off to the Philippian church, and he's been on three missionary journeys where he has set up these various churches, and one of them is the church there at Philippi. And so when he writes this letter off to these different churches, in particular to Philippi when he's in prison, one of the things that he's doing in the context here, you'll see this, is he's thanking them for a gift. Recently they sent him a gift, a financial gift, to further the ministry that God had begun in him. And they were all excited to do so. They couldn't wait to do so because they saw how God was working in his life and what God was doing to further churches. And so they participated and they gave a gift. And Paul writes back, and here's what he writes. Here's what he says. He says, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. Paul's saying, basically, listen, I know you're concerned about the work that God is doing And I thank you so much for the gift that you've sent. I really appreciate that. Then he says, I'm not saying this because I'm in need. Paul wants to make it very clear about his situation. He says, in effect, thank you so much for assisting me. I appreciate it. But I'm not trying to tell you that we're lacking anything or that we're needing your help. Hmm. Wait a minute. That's kind of odd, isn't it? I mean, I don't know about you, but if you watch television long enough or you've been around long enough, Almost every Christian ministry is in need of help, right? They're all asking for something along the way. And Paul's basically kind of debunking a little bit of that as if to say, hey, listen, yes, I would thank you for your gift, but I'm not really in a place in which I was lacking anything. Isn't that kind of odd? Because most of us, most of the time, we think we're lacking something, that we're we're in need of something. And you're going to see here in a moment why Paul can say this. Because it's real important to keep this in mind. Paul has learned something. In fact, he says these words. He goes on in Philippians 4.11. He says, For I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. So there's a word there that's really important. I have learned. There's something that Paul has learned there. The word for learned is especially used for disciples and for those who were gathering around to hear a rabbi Paul gleans something out of his life. He's there in prison, and he's looking back on his life, and he's thinking, okay, is there something I've learned here? Is there some sort of lesson that I've kind of pulled up that is really valuable that I think other people need to learn too? Because there's something to be said about it. I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. Now, (laughs) let's think about that statement for a moment, shall we? Does that seem weird? Content whatever the circumstances. How many of us are content whatever our circumstances are? I think it's hard. I think it's difficult when you think about being content with it in that sense. Because the word there is being self-sufficient. That he's in a place where he's totally, he feels self-sufficient, although he will depend upon Christ. He's not depending upon himself. But the word means kind of filled. It means in a place of being satisfied. He's totally satisfied, fulfilled, in whatever situation that comes along. I mean, many times we think our situations have to be right in order to be content, don't we? That we have, in order for us to be satisfied, we have to have the right situation, the right circumstance. Well, I'll be happy when I get a new house. I'll be happy when I get my next car. And it's not a clunker, right? It's not a 10-year-old car or a 15-year-old car because some of you are driving those, which is awesome. But I'll be happy when I get a new car. Or I'll be happy when I get my stimulus check, right? Some of you are still waiting for your stimulus checks, and you're like, when is that going to happen? Or I'll be happy when I get married and I get a ring on my finger. That's when I'll be happy. Or I'll be happy when we have our first child. Or I'll be happy when my favorite show on Netflix airs the next season. That's when I'll be happy. I can't wait for that next season. I'll be totally content when that next season comes out. Or I'll be content when I retire. Or I'll be content when I get out of my parents' house. And Your parents might be thinking the same thing. (laughs) I mean, the world tells us there are so many things that we need to be happy. Right? We need more money. We need better health. 
We need bigger and a newer house. We need a newer car. We need a different spouse. We need a different church. And all of these things are lies. I mean, they may make us happy initially for a time being, for a short time. But that newness wears off, doesn't it? And we wish we had something else. I love this poem that I found that illustrates the discontent that's so prevalent in a human heart. Just see if it kind of resonates for you. Here's what it says. It was spring, but it was summer that I wanted. The warm days, the great outdoors. It was summer, but the fall was what I wanted. The colorful leaves and the cool, dry air. It was fall, but it was uh, the winter that I wanted. The beautiful snow and the joy of the holidays. It was winter, but it was spring that I wanted. The warmth and the blossoming of nature. I was a child, but it was adulthood that I wanted. The freedom and the respect that goes with that. I was 20, but it was 30 that I was looking for to be more mature and sophisticated. I was retired, but it was the middle that I wanted. The presence of mind without limitations. And my life was over, but I never got what I wanted. That describes a lot of us. You see, the discontentment is a disease in our hearts that's running rampant in our society. It's something that we all feel, right? Every single one of you watching right now, I would imagine, feels at some level some discontentment somewhere. I once heard this statement, and I think it's true. See if you can resonate with it. It just says this. All the world lives in two tents, content and discontent. Content and discontent. All the world lives in one of these two tents. Either you're content or you're discontent. So I would just ask you this morning, let's do a little personal inventory. How many of you would say, and you don't have to put anything here, you don't have to comment, but just think in your own mind, how many of us are restless? Are you discontent at some level? Is there some level of being unfulfilled and unsatisfied? Can you resonate with that poem that I read? You're always looking for the next best thing or the next best season or the next best person that you could be with. There's a story about a wealthy Englishman who came downstairs one morning and heard his cook saying to herself, if I only had five, a five pound note, which was worth about $25 at the time, then I would be happy. So the wealthy Englishman quickly considered the matter and wanting the woman to be satisfied, came in and gave her a five-pound note. And the cook thanked him profusely. And the wealthy man left the room, but waited outside the door to hear if the cook might express her gratitude to God. And as soon as the wealthy man left the room, the cook said to herself, Why didn't I ask for ten rather than five? Isn't that how we're like? Isn't that what we're like where we are? Rather than sometimes being content with what we're being given and what we have, we always want something a little bit more. Wish we could ask for something a little bit more. Do we find ourselves acting like that cook? Is that where we are? Do we know what true contentment is? I want you to stop for a moment, do a little personal inventory, because I'm going to be doing one myself, and I've thought about this this week. When was the last time you said something like, well, I would be happy if, fill in the blank. I'd be happy if, what? Or, if I had blank, I'd be content. If I had more money, I'd be happy. If I had um, another child, I'd be happy. If um, my husband would pay more attention to me, I'd be happy. If my wife would do this, I'd be happy. When was the last time you said something like that? You caught yourself saying something like that. Because if you find yourself in a place where you're discontent, then you're like the rest of us. But Paul says this. He's in a situation that he is content in every and any circumstance. And Paul's in prison. How can he say that? How can he say that? He's chained to a pro Roman prison guard. He's not in a five-star hotel. He's not on a cruise ship. Right? How can he say that? In fact, if you look at Paul's life, you'd be amazed about what he goes through, and he still says he's content in whatever circumstance. But here's a quick little summary of what Paul goes through. He's stoned. He's been stoned. He's been dragged out of a city. He was beaten and thrown into jail. 
He had been in tribulations, in needs, in distresses, in imprisonments, in tumults. These are his own words. In labors, sleeplessness, and fastings. And he received five times lashings. He was beaten with rods three times. He was once stoned. I mean, this is a guy who went through a lot of stuff. This is not an easy life for Paul. And he experienced all of this. And he had close encounters with death. How in the world can he say that he's content in any situation? It doesn't seem natural. I mean, the rest of us, most of us haven't gone through what Paul has, and we're still not content, right? And Paul goes on, he says, listen, I know what it is to be in need and what it is to have plenty. Hmm. Know what it is to have plenty. So Paul knew the extremes. He knew what it was like to be in need, but he also knew what it was to be in plenty. And I think sometimes here in America, if you're watching in America, I have friends who live around different places, but if you're watching in America today, we have a hard time resonating with what true need is because we are in a place where we have a lot of our needs met and maybe there are a few people who don't, a number of people who don't. But for the most part, we live in a society, catch this, don't miss this, where we live in the top 96% of the world. In other words, we live in the top 4% of the world. The rest of the 96% of the world financially lives below us. Put it in perspective, right? Do you realize that 40% of the world does not have internet? I mean, right now you're watching this on the internet, probably. 40% of the world doesn't have that. 30% of the world doesn't have access to clean drinking water. Now, this really caught my eye. 80% of the world has no vehicle. I have two of them, right? And some of you have two who are watching right now. You don't realize 80% of the world doesn't have that. Doesn't even have one. You feeling privileged yet? Yeah. But Paul says, I have learned the secret of being content. So I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to be in plenty. But I've learned a secret. I've learned something over the last number of years of my life. Here's what I've learned. I've learned to be content. How can he say I've learned to be content? Because here's what the other words are. Don't miss this. And probably this is one of the most quoted verses in all of Philippians chapter 4. Here's what he says. I can do all things, all this through him who gives me strength. I can do all the things that I've gone through, all the trials, all the tribulations, all the things I've gone through, the times of need. I can do all of that because of one purpose, one reason. Because of him. Because of God. God's the one who's given me strength is what he's saying there. Right? God's the one who's helped me going forward. Now this is important because I want you to capture this. Really to be content... We have to understand the secret is this. To, to, to be content, anchor your heart to Christ. If you want to be content, if you want to know what the secret is to being content, whatever the circumstance, no matter what you go through, whether it looks like 2020 or not, right, you have to anchor your heart to Christ. If you want to be content, thoroughly content, that's where it's at. Now, there's a really cool passage I want to tell you about in 1 Samuel chapter 30. So here's the picture. So you got David. David is out with his men. They've been fighting the Philistines. And they've been out fighting the Philistines for quite some time. And they come back into Ziglag, which is where they have their homes and they, where their wives are and their kids are. And they discover that another uh, opposing army, the Amicalites, have come in and that they have burned down their houses and they have taken off their wives and they have taken off with their kids. So I want you to capture this. David and his men come home. They're tired from already fighting battles. They come back. Their houses are burned. Can you imagine your house being on fire? Some of you have come back to that. Um, how tragic and how, you know, just kind of horrifying that is. Their houses are being burned. Their, their children are being taken, are, are gone. Their wives are gone. And, they, and then all of a sudden, if that doesn't get worse for David, and David is probably beside himself, I mean, totally emotionally under duress, in fact, the word there used, it says David was greatly distressed. And the word there is basically kind of summed up as like emotional distress. I mean, like emotionally spent. Anybody emotionally spent after 2020 so far? I mean, like, oh my gosh, can anything else go wrong? 
that's where David is. He's at that place. So if you can really resonate, you get where David is at. And David's at this place. And then his men turn on him and they say, listen, we're going to stone David. His situation went from bad to really, really bad. What does David do? And the topsy-turvy all around him, that's, you know, stuff is going on, crap is going on. He's in emotional duress. What does he do? Where does he get his contentment? Because you and I both know he's not content, right? He's just not. And at a scale of 1 to 10, he's got to be really, really, really discontent. Probably being a 10. So what does he do? There's a little passage there that says this. But David found strength in his God. He found strength in his God. In other words, what did David do? He went to go spend some time with God. And all the stuff that's going on, he didn't invest any time in all the distractions and all the noise. He went and said, listen, I've got to get some time alone with my God. I want to go there to get strength and contentment. I got to get right with God first. That's a beautiful image and story of putting our priorities in the right place so that we can find contentment. See, David knew he couldn't find contentment in his men ultimately. He he knew that he couldn't find contentment ultimately in his wives. He had two of them. He knew that he couldn't find contentment in his kids as invaluable as they are. And today we can't find contentment in a bottle and a pill right? And pornography, and whatever it is that you and I might struggle with, and whatever you and I might turn to, those aren't the answers. You see, what David did is he cast out an anchor. He was looking for an anchor, someone, something to anchor to. And what he did is he cast out an anchor. And what Paul did, he would cast out an anchor because he rooted that they, they both rooted themselves in who Christ was. They found their contentment in God. Now, when you and I, when we go out fishing, right? So some of you are fishermen, and you'll appreciate this analogy. When you go out fishermen and you want to stay in one place for a while, and you want to fish, you throw out an anchor, right? Now, some of you might not throw out an anchor, but my dad and I, when we go fishing, we'd throw out an anchor and we'd stay there for a while. And we'd just fish, especially if we found a really, really good spot. We'd just throw an anchor out and we'd fish for a while. Or what we do is we throw out an anchor and my brother and I would jump out of the boat and we'd go swimming, right? So at least the boat was staying in one place. Anchors are great for holding the boat in place. And that's what they're designed to do. Whether it's calm on the sea or whether it's not. An anchor gets embedded in the sea floor or the lake floor. And once it's there, the, the whole goal is for it to stay there no matter what happens above. No matter how choppy the waters are, no matter how rough the seas are, right, that anchor is to hold. And if you have a large anchor out, all the better. Or if you have several anchors out, all the better, right? Because regardless, the floor of the ocean is not moving, right? The floor of the sea isn't going to move. Everything else might move. The ocean might move. The boat might move. You might move. But the ocean, is not, the ocean floor is not going to move. So you sink your anchor into something that's immovable, something that's in, uh, unshakable. Well, that's what Paul does. That's what David does. They cast out an anchor into something immovable, God himself. Something that's unshakable, God himself. Something that will not, in the midst of all the stuff going on, the storms of life, will not move. And that's God. That's where we get the ultimate strength and we get the ultimate contentment. Because if you anchor, if your anchor doesn't go deeper than the strength of the storm... You're going to drift. I promise you that. And some of you know that, right? You know that maybe you've been drifting. Maybe these last couple of months, the last couple of weeks, you've been drifting because you realize your anchor is not as secure. Or maybe you haven't even thrown an anchor out. Or maybe your anchor is in the wrong place. But I will promise you this. If you will anchor yourself in the person of God, and the person activity of God, if you anchor yourself in his character, if you anchor yourself in his promises, if you anchor yourself in his nature, which is deeper than any storm, deeper than any circumstance, you will find yourself in a place in which you have peace and you have contentment because that source does not drain. That source does not leave. That source does not fail. Isn't that awesome? That's a great thing. That's exciting.
right? So some, how about some thumbs up and some hearts for that? Because I think it's real important that we capture that, hey, listen, if we anchor ourselves in Christ, it's, he's unmovable. He's unshakable, right? We can do that and understand that in the process that God is a good and faithful God. So I want you to look back over the last four months for a moment. So thanks for the likes and the thumbs up. I want you to think about for the last five, four, four months for a second. They have been topsy-turvy, right? They have been kind of crazy. And where you were at, between the COVID-19, the racial injustice, and the uh, political upseas system and upheaval, right? The, the killer hornets, <laughs> you know, possibly dinosaurs coming, we don't know. But in all of that, how content have you been? How peaceful have you been? How calm have you been? Think about that just for a second. For those of you who've anchored yourself in Christ, I would imagine that you probably are pretty calm through this. But if you haven't, and even if you have, you might sense, boy, it's been topsy-turvy and crazy. So practically, what does it mean to anchor yourself in Christ? So what do I mean by an anchor? What I mean by an anchor is a discipline that you intentionally do to keep Christ in the very center of your life. And if those of you who don't have Christ in the very centerpiece of your life, it's a discipline to help you start to begin to consider putting Christ in the center of your life. So I want you to see what a number of other people that I've talked to, I've talked to a few people this week, how they have handled the last four months as far as anchoring themselves and keeping peace and keeping contentment, what they have done. So here's some quotes from some people and what they do. And I want you to see as I read these quotes, I want you to see what their anchors are. When I say an anchor and discipline that keeps them rooted in the bedrock of who Christ is. So an anchor that keeps them rooted. I want you to see if you can pick out some of those anchors, some of those disciplines. So one lady that I talked to said this in the last four months and what she's done. I've been more intentional about making time for meditation and prayer. I have downloaded the Bible on my audible account and listened to it throughout the day. I've also listened to worship music off, and I've become an absolute rock star in my car and shower. <laughs> I love that. Rock star in your car, rock star in your shower. That's really cool. So what do you notice there about some anchors? Right? I mean, she's in a place where she's praying. She's in a place where she's being intentional, about taking time with God. Another person said this, being able to interact and study the word with other believers on Zoom has greatly encouraged me. What are the anchors there? Well, she's had this fellowship, right? She's had this time of being on Zoom with some other people. It's greatly encouraged her. Another person said, when I go to bed at night, I listen to the Bible on Alexa when I go to sleep. That's a great idea, right? Some of you are like, well, who's Alexa? Well, you know, so when you, you know, you listen to these apps where they, you can speak into the phone and you can call up and they, of course, they have these devices where you can speak to them now and they'll play whatever you want them to play. And that's simply what she, that this person is doing. Another person said this, I enjoy my time at home. I watch all of this creation all over our yard, the birds and the bees and the rabbits, the squirrels, the chipmunks and the skunks. This person has skunks in their backyard, right? And they think about what great, a great God they have. And I get to see and hear and smell and feel everything that he's created. This is how I maintain my peace. I love that. Through nature. Nature grounding this person and helping them understand who God is and be content in who God is and what he has made. Do you see the disciplines there? Do you see the anchors there? Prayer, meditation, right? Maybe a meditation on on nature and who God and what he's doing through that. Um, Fellowship with other people. All of those things are their anchors. They throw out an anchor to help them hold on to the presence of Christ in their life. And those anchors have given them strength, and those anchors have given them contentment. What a beautiful thing. And the more anchor lines that you have in the water, the better. The better. Because here's something you need to know, a a truth that's so important. Being content and staying content takes work. Let's just, could you say that at home with me? Being content and staying content takes what? Work. Work. Right? Would you agree with that? In order to stay content, it's not something you just arrive at. It's not something that's just automatic. It takes work. You have to have work at that because it's hard. Because the world around us wants to push us off. It wants us to drift. The world around us is drifting. And the world around us, if we hook ourselves to the world, we're just going to drift with the world. 
it takes work to go against the drift. And it's hard. The good news is if you anchor yourself to Christ through a discipline, or several disciplines, prayer, Bible study, fellowship, the more likely you're going to find strength and contentment through Christ that is so valuable for you and for me. So, in the next five years that you have the rest of your life, maybe you have 50 years left in your life, maybe you have 70 years in your life, if you want contentment, make sure you're anchoring yourself in reading God's Word, being part of a church family, right? Uh, being involved in a Bible study. So I want to challenge you. I want to challenge you today to just start with one of these. You pick one of Pick one of these anchors. So maybe you're in a place right now, you're kind of checking out the faith and you're not sure. You've been watching for a while. You're like, oh, I could try this. Or maybe you're watching right now and you say, listen, I'm a, I'm a solid follower of Christ, but I could use one more anchor. I could throw another anchor out, another discipline that I know could really benefit me, that could really help me not to go adrift. And so here are some suggestions. Let me give you three different challenges. You could download your Bible app and start reading. So that's one thing you could do. And so I would recommend going to U version and downloading that. You could attend church regularly, which is important. If you can't go to church uh, you know, in person, you can go online like you're doing right now. Pray for five minutes a day. So you could pick one of these, right? You could pick one of the three of these. You could... Decide, hey, listen, I'm going to go ahead and download a Bible app, or I'm going to start reading my Bible. I'm going to start reading the book of Genesis. I'm going to start reading in the New Testament with Matthew. Or, hey, listen, I'm going to attend church regularly. I'm going to continue to watch and continue to be fed. Or I'm going to start praying for five minutes a day. I'll set my timer for five minutes, and for five minutes I'm going to praise God, and then at the end I'll pray for something that I need God to do, and I'll try doing that for five days a week. And I would just challenge you to pick one of those. Pick one of those. You don't have to pick all three. Pick one of them today so that you will find a little bit more contentment, a little bit more satisfaction, a little bit more fulfillment in life, a little more appreciation and gratitude. And I think you'll start seeing a difference because in this world, as we're going through, it is so easy to drift. Would you say amen to that? Right? I would would say definitely it's it's a challenge for us. So that being said... You know, the more circumstances are coming, some of them are not favorable. And I'm sorry to say that, hey, listen, unless we're prepared, you know, we're going to start seeing some really rough stuff come at us, you know, depending upon what happens. So what action will you take? What anchors are you throwing out to embed yourself in the immovable love and the nature of God? What are you doing? What's that look like? I challenge you today to take a step, whether it's reading the Bible whether it's um, going to church regularly or whether it's fellowshipping with believers uh, or picking one of these disciplines. So let's pray together, shall we? Gracious God, we thank you so much for this day. Thank you for who you are and for what you're doing. And I pray now for you to help us. Give us direction. Give us your, um, your power, your strength. I pray, Father, that you help us to be rooted in who you are. Help us to understand that we cannot find contentment this side of this world. But only in and through you. You are the one who was mighty. You are the one who was great. So I pray you help us to find strength there in who you are. And help us, Lord, to take initiative against the world that's adrift around us. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Hey, quick announcement before you hop off today. So August 2nd, uh, we're having a baptism time. We're going to go have a sh- we're going to Shiloh, which is a campground, which is in near Eaton, New York, and we're going to be baptizing some people. We're also going to be recognizing those who are going into the military. So we'll be praying over some of those individuals. So if you'd like to be baptized, or if you're in- if you're going into the military, let us know. We'll be happy to incorporate you there. We're also going to have a picnic, which is going to be uh, there, at- and we're going to ask people to just bring their own food and their own drinks so that we, we continue to maintain quarantine guidelines. But that's going to happen August 2nd, so please join us for that. That would be tremendous if you could come out and join us for August 2nd. We're going to be meeting there at 1 o'clock for the service, um, and we're going to be doing all of those different things. So that's August 2nd. We're going to do that. Thanks for watching today. I'm sorry. It sounds like we had some Internet issues there, and I apologize for that. I'm not quite sure what happened. We'll have to look into that. But before you hop off, could you just hit the share button and share this with other people so they can see and be encouraged as well? That would help us. Thank you, everybody. God bless you all. Enjoy the rest of your day.